This unearthly device is a Grumman Lunar Module, the most specialized yet most broadly capable manned space vehicle ever built. On July 20th, 1969, a sister ship of this one, here in the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, flew from its Apollo 11 mothercraft to the surface of the moon and back again, safely carrying the first two human beings ever to set foot on a non-terrestrial surface. In 1961, when he was a young engineer of 32, Thomas J. Kelly headed the design of that remarkable machine. But America's quest for the moon actually began four years earlier, on a fateful day in 1957. I still remember when the, when the Sputnik uh, was launched, uh, which kind of uh, was a rude awakening uh, uh, for this country and uh, for me personally about the space age. When the uh, Sputnik came along, it just gave impetus to what we were doing. And I guess uh, I personally appreciated it. It was like uh, being able to give the government a prod to do what you thought they should be doing all along. Some found consolation in the shock, but Sputnik was a public relations disaster for the United States. Yet worse was to come. First the Soviets sent a dog into orbit, then a man. By 1961, John F. Kennedy was president. For him, the worsening situation represented a direct political challenge. We insisted that we should see the president. We felt it was an important issue. And we did see President Kennedy and he was really not prepared to make a decision on the follow-on to Mercury, which was Apollo. Even in those days, it was called Apollo. But he did agree to go ahead with it, with a with a development of the larger booster, the Saturn. And uh, and then about I would guess uh, offhand maybe three or four weeks later, cosmonaut Gagarin orbited the Earth. And at that point, uh, President Kennedy uh, realized that there was a an immediate policy issue, a paper was put together that, that uh, uh, outlined the manned program to the moon and said that, we've, that McNamara and Webb felt that that was the right goal to take, that it was an achievable goal. Well, that's the reason that we really got the program going so well, is because the people in this country thought that the Russians were ahead of us. And, and, of course, the Russians were ahead of us. On May 5th, 1961, Alan Shepard became America's first man in space. The flight was embarrassingly brief in duration, simply a ballistic lob to an altitude of 116 miles and a water landing barely 300 miles downrange. But the emotional impact was enormous. The United States allowed the world to watch, something the Soviets would never have dared. We were in the race. And exactly 20 days later, John Kennedy named the finish line. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. It was an awesome, perhaps even impossible goal, for nobody had yet seriously considered the question of exactly how to land a vehicle on the moon, or more important, get it off again. When the original idea of going to the moon was conceived, um, NASA hadn't really pinned down exactly how they were going to go to the moon. Uh, the lunar orbit rendezvous approach uh, was an alternative. I think it was a pretty ingenious alternative. Uh, the person who uh, is credited with having come up with the original ideas, John Hobolt uh, at NASA, and we read uh, one of his early papers on that, and uh, we, we checked all the calculations ourselves, and, uh, and it seemed like a pretty attractive idea to us. So we, in the final analysis, uh, the lunar orbit rendezvous approach uh, was selected because it was more economical uh, specifically, the command module could be specialized for re-entry, which was a very demanding environment and requires a uh, hard, compact, heat-resistant vehicle in order to survive, aerodynamically shaped. Um, in contrast, uh, the lunar module 
was able to be specialized for operations in space and on the moon, uh, where it has no aerodynamics to contend with and uh, very little in the way of uh, forces, either gravity or, uh, or anything else. The request for bid on the lunar module was unique in my experience in that it did not uh, ask for a specific design. It was a almost like a game of 20 questions. Uh, you answer these questions and if we think you know what you're talking about, we'll talk to you later. And consequently, uh, we tried to do that. Now, to answer the questions, we had to postulate a design. And that really is what was shown in that little uh, wood model that uh, sits up there on the shelf. We thought that, uh, in effect, when we finally did uh, receive uh, indication that we were the winners, that, that we would develop that design. But it turned out that, no, we had just passed the entrance examination and that we would have to uh, uh, work with uh, the, what is now the Johnson Center to develop a design. So in effect, the preliminary design of the lunar module started from scratch after the award. That development work began in November 1962 when it was announced that Grumman had won the LEM competition. It wasn't the first time Grumman had been on the leading edge. The best analogy uh, to the problem of designing a spacecraft that uh, seemed to be a fighter airplane. We didn't know anything about space any more than uh, uh, most people did at that time. Uh, but we did know a lot about uh, producing uh, reliable flying machines that had to operate in a very hostile and demanding environment. If you think about the skills that we, that we had available from the aircraft design world, were very, really very directly applicable uh, to the design of the lunar module. Uh, but everything else was uh, a very logical extension of the aircraft designer's desire to go higher, faster, and farther. At regular intervals during the design of the lunar module, Grumman built full-size models of the machine. With these mock-ups, engineers could check the fit of systems, astronauts could practice their procedures, and NASA could evaluate Grumman's progress. NASA would uh, come with literally hundreds of people. They would include all the astronauts, and all the leaders uh, of the various NASA centers and, uh, and their supporting uh, uh, cast of engineers and experts. Now, in the case of the LEM, uh, the crew had a lot of contact with the LEM besides uh, just flying it from inside the crew compartment. It also served as their home base when it was on the moon, and the descent stage uh, housed all the scientific equipment. All of those aspects uh, of the LEM that the, that the crew would actually use had to be evaluated in the mock-ups. We had a, uh, a sling with a, like a big bungee that ran down from the ceiling. And what the astronaut would do would hook it onto his suit and he would go up the ladder, e ingress and egress out of the uh, LEM it was quite interesting, and uh, if you ever got on one of those things, it was quite a thrill. It's like jumping off of a, uh, a tree into water and then bouncing back up again. The design of the landing gear is, is uh, an interesting story in itself. Now, this, uh, this was influenced by a couple of factors. It was influenced by the theories as to what the lunar surface might consist of, they varied all the way from a very light powdery dust into which the whole limb might sink. Uh, that was one extreme. Uh, the other extreme was that it was going to be uh, uh, ice, uh, very slippery, very hard uh, in, in uh, some areas. On a 250,000 mile trip, weight was critical. As the design developed from concept to hardware, the shape and structure changed in several significant ways. When you compare these two models, the proposal model and the, and the final version of the LEM, uh, many of the, of the differences that you see 
uh, the result of our desire to save weight on the, on the lunar module. This proposal model had aircraft style seats. Uh, we realized that we really didn't need seats in uh, zero G or even one six G. So in this uh, LEM and in the real LEMs, uh, the crew was in a stand up position. So what we were able to do, since the crew was standing up, we were able to design it such that the window was very close to the crew's eye. And that basically cut down the glass area drastically. While the vehicle was being built in Bethpage, Grumman had to test the LEMS engines as well. The fuel was far too dangerous to mix or store anywhere short of a desert. And the desert was where Grumman went, to White Sands, New Mexico and a spear point operation, which White Sands was, because it came so far in advance of the operations at the Cape. Initially, we had to find out whether this descent engine could be fired, gimbaled, throttled, and would it, in fact, fire as long as this descent mission lasted. And we had an altitude chamber for the descent stage, and we had an altitude chamber for the ascent stage. The ascent stage was far more critical uh, in the mission than the descent stage because it had no backup. And if there was anything that had to be absolutely perfect in the lunar module, it was the ascent engine. Because if you press the button to go back out into orbit around the moon and it didn't fire, the astronauts were lost. In three wars, Grumman airplanes built a reputation for bringing their crews back alive. The LEM would, too. Each LEM would be used just once, but Grumman built them to last. The actual building was, was done in a very handcrafted, uh, customized fashion. And in many, many cases, uh, you were strictly relying on the integrity of that particular workman because after he put something together, it was very, very difficult to tell whether it had been done uh, properly or not. Consequently, when the LEM was in the factory, uh, you could hardly see it. It was surrounded by scaffolding and protective covers of all types, both externally and inside the uh, the crew compartment. We also had a rotate and clean machine, which they also called a tumbler. And what that did was, uh, I think we had three cycles of tumbling. And it took all of the debris and dust and rivets, rivet tails and what have you. And we would catch it and weigh it on a big canvas sheet. And as you progressed along better and everybody got more used to working with this type of environment, the ship became much cleaner. Here on Earth, the LEM was out of its element. Amid the bustle of a factory, the LEM was fragile, delicate. In fact, its outermost skin was a high-tech version of what people used to call tinfoil. On the surface of the moon, uh, you went from like uh, plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit in the sunlight to minus 250 in the shade. And that happened fairly abruptly. Um, the strategy, the de design strategy that we used was to wrap the lunar module in insulation so that it would be basically thermally isolated from uh, its surroundings. Now that insulation was mylar. It was uh, an aluminized mylar. The mylar itself was kind of a gold color and it's very prominent in any of the pictures of the limb uh, that you see.